Okay, I think we're going to make a start. Um, hello everyone and welcome to this webinar on building culturally safer and relationally stronger schools. My name is Sophie Rudolph and I'm a lecturer at the Melbourne Graduate School of Education and I co-convene the Justice Involved Young People Network with my colleague in criminology, Dr. Diana Johns. Um, I'd like to begin today by acknowledging that I am currently on the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung and Bunrung peoples of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us for this event. I also acknowledge that First Nations people have never ceded sovereignty in Australia and that communities continue to resist the impositions and violence of the settler state in their lives. Um, <coughs> at this point, I would um, just like to let you know, of course, that we are all um, working from home at the moment. And so um, we're just working with the combined <laughs> technology um, that we have and um, just to uh, bear with us <laughs> in that. Um, and I'd also like, you, like to invite you to acknowledge the country that you're currently on in the chat. So the chat will be open for this purpose and then we'll move to the Q&A function for questions for the panel. I'd also like to let you know that we're recording this session and it will be available on the MGSC YouTube channel. And also that the closed captions function should be available if you would like to use that. I'd also like to give a shout out to Zane Kingy and Genevieve Costigan from the MGSC IT and comms team for helping us out with the webinar today and to Michelle McDonnell and Joe Sullivan for promotion and event management. So to give a little context for the panel today, the Justice Involved Young People Network was initiated by Dr. Diana Johns and me in an effort to bring together the disciplines of education and criminology to look more holistically at the issues of young people's involvement in the criminal justice system. It is well understood that young people who have contact with the criminal justice system typically present with a range of social and emotional challenges and often experiences of neglect and abuse. It is also common that these young people have had unsatisfactory experiences with the school system and that the majority of young people involved in the justice system are um, racialized, that is identifying as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander or as people of colour. And as the Black Lives Matter movement has recently highlighted, the experiences of racialized communities with police violence and deaths in custody is an injustice felt across settler colonial contexts. And yet we also know that positive experiences with education have the capacity to support, protect and empower young people individually and collectively. It is precisely this capacity of education that the Victorian Youth Justice Strategic Plan 2020 to 2030 highlights. And so in this webinar, we wanted to open up a deep conversation about addressing the enduring injustices of our education system and looking at ways of working to enable the powerful potential of education to better serve young people, particularly those from racialized communities. And so we've brought together this wonderful panel to reflect from both researcher and practice perspectives on these challenges. And we hope that um, those of you listening today who are interested in continuing this conversation and acting on these issues will make contact with the network so that we can continue to do this work collectively. So now to introduce our panelists. First, we'll hear from Dr. Melita Hogarth, who is a Gamilaroi woman and Assistant Dean Indigenous at the Melbourne Graduate School of Education. Melita has over 20 years of experience as a secondary school teacher, and her education research is pioneering new ways of critically engaging with the structural injustices in school policy and practice. Next, Dr. Nikki Moody will present some recent research on Indigenous schooling. Nikki is a Gomorrah Gamilaroi woman and senior lecturer in Indigenous Studies at the University of Melbourne. She has a background in sociology and policy studies, 
and is co-convener of the Indigenous Settler Relations Collaboration based in the School of Arts at the University of Melbourne. Following Nikki, we will hear from Dr. Jessica Ganaway, who is a lecturer in education at the Melbourne Graduate School of Education. Jessica has taught in a range of secondary school settings and as a non-Indigenous teacher researcher, her work is interested in literacy pedagogy and decolonial de possibilities in the classroom. And finally, we'll hear from Leah Avena, who is a Tuvaluan mother, musician, broadcaster and educator. Leah is currently the culturally responsive pedagogy leader at Parkville College and is working on building culturally responsive pedagogy approaches across education programs in youth justice settings as a way of strengthening education relationships and decolonizing teaching practices. So it's a wonderful panel and I'm pleased now to hand over to Dr. Melita Hogarth to get us started. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sophie. And um, thank you one and all for um, joining us. And I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the lands of, that I'm on the land of the Wadawurrung people. And um, it's a pleasure to be presenting today. Um, from, from my perspective, I'm going to talk about a paper or a book chapter that um, Professor Tracy Bunder and I um, wrote recently on, um, or is about to be published, uh, a book chapter that we called How to Make Schools Less White. In this paper, we shared the observed and lived experiences of ourselves as teachers and staff within the schooling sector and the shared stories of peers and colleagues within other schools or the hypothesized school and some of the incidents that we have seen take place that further act to silence and dismiss the Indigenous voice in schools. It was, it's our position that the, the school is a space of power where the knowledge systems are not of our own making and rather are built from the knowledge systems of the dominant culture and where the outcomes for schooling for Aboriginal students are issues that cry out for redress. One such story that we shared was that of the eternally suspended Aboriginal student, which I'll share with you now. Every year, just before the end of term three, the boarding schools descended on the community to encourage enrolment into the teaching and learning opportunities provided. Parents would listen to the pictures of various schools offering diverse learning experiences for their children. And by the end of the day, a vast number of the student clientele had been enrolled for the following year at one of the more prestigious boarding schools. One week before term one began, the buses arrived to transport the students to the boarding schools. Students eager faced and excited about the new scene waited in the early hours outside the council chambers, waiting for the buses. Quick goodbyes to parents were exchanged and then they were gone, with the hopes of the community to achieve and excel resting on their shoulders. Some of the students did exceptionally well and did indeed adapt to their new learning environments. Others did not. This story is about those students the students who, in a very short number of weeks, would return to the community, suspended for an extended length of time, sometimes not even a stated length of time. It would always be the week after census, and suddenly these students were at our school on community wishing to be enrolled. Of course, there was no hesitation with enrolling the student. However, from a financial perspective for the school, no funding was available to assist in providing for these late enrolments as they had already been claimed by the boarding schools. The reasons for suspension varied and according to some of the students and their parents, no reason was provided on several occasions. The frustration only grew when the boarding school would then offer the students opportunity to re-enroll in semester two. Sometimes students would return to the boarding school only to be suspended again just after census day. 
when I shared that story with Tracy, her response to the story went something like this. Great ancestor, please give me the strength. You see, the problem is the commodification of our children is both unethical and mean-spirited. The principle of reciprocity is a tradition that is alive within our communities. It's a protocol that speaks to responsibilities inherent in engagement. In the story that I shared, it makes explicit the everyday giving of our children over to education systems, which we are all well aware can be problematic and run counter to our ways of being. Aboriginal communities expect in return that our next generations will be cared for and educated. The manipulation of a funding system to meet the individual needs of prestigious or otherwise schools, while dishonest, also enables a slippage for blaming the Aboriginal student. The Aboriginal student is a what the Arant Aboriginal student is a well entrenched story that is so persuasive that the potential for pushback on this form of unjust accounting is offered little resistance. The private school is able to continue this practice without accountability, and as a result, the Aboriginal student story gains greater currency to the point where it can be believed as a fixed cultural trait that has the taint of biological predetermination. No doubt there is a level of sophistication in this lie, which also tricks Aboriginal parents to ride a trauma merry-go-round whereby hope for the, for the child, the family and the community, shame when the possibilities of celebration turns to embarrassment and hope again are realised in quick succession, thus leaving little capacity for to question such institutional behaviours. Private school behaviour of this type needs to be reported to the funding authorities, and the schools who triage this educational injury and the parents of the students affected need to be empowered to report such educational injustices. But, you know, school, schools and school leaders do, do need to be made more accountable for their Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. There's been many horror stories regarding the misuse of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander student funding. And not all schools get away with this, with such practices. Being from Queensland, there was the disgrace that fell on the then principal of um, Jarrigan College who was found guilty of defrauding the government through the claim of non-existent students. Back in 2014, the Cairns Post reported that the principal had lied about the attendance of 242 non-existent students, a fraudulent overclaim which secured more than $3.4 million. So it's encouraging to know that schools can and are held accountable. The intent of the paper was to begin a critical conversation in schools to look at the ways that Indigenous peoples are positioned within the system. Policy suggests that Indigenous people should be involved in the decision making at all levels. And yet I share this story from the six to seven on offer within the chapter because I wanted to problematize the notion that schools and education are often positioned as the saving grace and the solution for Indigenous kids. I also share it because it does not position the student as the perpetrator, but moreover the systems. We would like to believe that schools have the best intentions for our kids and that they want to support success, but when we become a commodity, ensuring the building of a new swimming pool or meeting priority targets for diversity and inclusion, our education is not central to the decision making. I feel that this situation we now find ourselves in has really brought to the forefront the inequities in education and is creating a space where these conversations are even more critical to affect change because I honestly think we are in a space where change is possible. I would love to see schools really consider the ways in which they work with Indigenous kids. And that's it from me. So I'm gonna pass over to my colleague, Dr. Nikki Moody.
Yahama, everyone. Uh, thank you, Melita. Uh, I uh, just want to let you know that I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people talking to you from my little apartment in Footscray today. I hope you're all uh, well and, and safe wherever you are. I want to make two points in my time with you today. Uh, the first point that I want to make is around thinking sociologically about the role of schools and prisons in society. And this is really about focusing on whose idea of success we're listening to. The second point that I wanna make is about what the research tells us specifically about Indigenous education. So firstly, as a sociologist, uh, it's pretty normal to think about different institutions in our society how they work and what they're designed to achieve. A list of social institutions usually includes something like the health and education systems, the government, legal systems, uh, the family and, and languages, right, for example. So these are the patterns of human behaviour that are really stable over time, they don't tend to change, and they're the primary ways that we organise the life and death matters of our collective existence together. When it comes to Indigenous people's experience, we first have to acknowledge that in Australia, these are settler colonial institutions. And that's a big leap for a lot of people to make. But the model for our public service, right, was designed by the British East India Company in the 1800s when the English used a kind of pirate mercenary uh, transnational corporation to invade India. Every single institution, every single system and process used to govern people in Australia is an import. The education system we have now is still largely based on the model introduced to support the Industrial Revolution in England during the 1800s. This is a model that required the poor to develop basic literacy, numeracy and rule following behaviour in order to gainfully work in the factories that were processing the cotton and wool grown in the slave colonies. Now at this current moment in time, I wanna reiterate that that's literally just the textbook definition, right? But I think the post-truth moment that we're all living in kind of demands that I make that explicit. So point one is that everything that governs our lives in Australia is a, a settler colonial institution. Point two, obviously, is therefore that these are not Indigenous institutions. Now the, the poorly informed and the racist might suggest that Indigenous people do not in fact have institutions, which as I said is both poorly informed and racist. Of course Indigenous societies had our own legal systems, education systems, health systems and so on, but the past 232 years has seen the very systematic attempted destruction of those. But, and this is a very big but, many Indigenous institutions are still alive. The protocol of using the place that you come from in order to introduce who you are, the, the process of extended family care for little ones, and in case you missed it, right, like all cultural systems change over time. They don't evolve. Uh, social systems don't work like biological systems, of course, but they do change. So Indigenous people have the right to change the way our social systems and institutions work. It is perfectly reasonable to use a, a Dremel or a pyrography kit instead of heated stone or, or wire to carve clapsticks or, or cloaks. Um, it's perfectly reasonable to use apps and dictionaries for language revival, right, the list goes on. I make this point because I want to separate the mode of cultural transmission, the tools or strategies or technologies used to transfer cultural information from the actual content that is being transmitted. What is absolutely still being transmitted is information about histories and families and cultural practices, the ideas and the values that make us Indigenous. Because when we talk about values, I think it's it's easier often to explore the kinds of values that we expect our institutions to transmit. Our school system is still mostly oriented to making uh, literate numerate workers who become valuable employees. Um, and indeed for many people that's perfectly reasonable, right? Like why would it be any other way? But what values does our justice system, for example, aim to achieve? 
It can't be to prevent crime or stop people reoffending, uh, because nearly half of all people in prison will come back again. So prisons don't stop people committing crimes or prevent people from committing new crimes, obviously. Uh, so, so what are prisons really for? And this is a question that has occupied uh, criminologists and sociologists for a very long time. Um, largely for, for punishment, for warehousing people deemed problematic or, or deviant. Um, they're certainly not healing places and they're certainly not designed to transmit indigenous values. Um, otherwise, there'd, there'd be no prisons. So the solution usually posited is that, is that making problematic or, or damaged or deviant people become useful members of society uh, can be achieved through education. Now, if that was the case, it would have kind of already happened, right? But it hasn't, uh, so it's not, except in uh, some very, very few exceptional cases. So part of that problem, I think, lies in a misunderstanding of the difference between schooling and education. If we're to focus on education or perhaps learning as a broader concept than just schooling, we get to open up a bigger conversation about whose values are transmitted through the learning process. In settler colonial institutions, all of them, the values that are transmitted are settler colonial values, largely British, perhaps Eurocentric, um, often, often very, very white. And these values determine what we mean when we say success. What does it mean for a person to be successful in a white society? And the, the, the research is very clear, right? These are very largely very individualistic values of, of personal achievement, um, goals of material success, so on and so forth. But what about Indigenous values? What is Indigenous about an Indigenous person's success? Now, of course, it's really important to say these things aren't mutually exclusive, obviously, but there are different cultural patterns and different cultural values around what it means to be a good person, to be part of society, to have a set of priorities that come from family and country, for example. For the past few years, I've been part of a, a wonderful research team uh, led by Gubby Gubby Man, Dr. Kevin Lowe, and joined by a, a team of, of fairly incredible researchers, including Sophie, um, your host today. People like John Gunter, Neil Harrison, Greg Bass, Jacinta Maxwell. And together, we have reviewed over 13,000 studies on Indigenous education to find out what has good evidence and what doesn't. We did this mostly because we were sick of seeing researchers going to community and asking the same questions that they have been asking for the past 40 years. Indigenous students, parents, families, communities, teachers, all being asked the same tired questions about what works, about community engagement, about direct instruction, about attendance, the same questions over and over and over again. So we thought, well, let's have a look at the research that has actually been done with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. To be included in our study, a paper had to actually report on talking to mob somehow. Not, not theoretically, although I, I want to recognise the value of, of that work, uh, but not like I, I walked past a black fella once or like my dad was a, a cop in Alice Springs, right? Like our studies actually had to have data. We wanted to lift up Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices that had already been included in the research over many, many years and say here, people have been telling you the same thing for decades. Stop asking the same questions and listen. And I could talk about how important connection to culture is in that research, but I want to highlight for me what is one of the most important differences which is how Indigenous and non-Indigenous people view success. They're two often incommensurate visions of Indigenous school student success. In this research, Indigenous families and communities talk about success in terms of what might, might be understood as civic inclusion and participation. And by this, I mean inclusion as Indigenous in both Indigenous and non-Indigenous polities. Schools and governments instead talk about jobs. Like I said, they aren't mutually exclusive, but they do highlight radically different ontological positions. 
the former, which is success as inclusion, sees students as already constituted by family, culture and community and bearing considerable responsibility for themselves and for others. The former, uh, the, sorry, from this perspective, schooling bears the responsibility of preparing students for fulsome participation in society that includes both Indigenous and settler peoples. In contrast, schools and governments tend to see inclusion as uh, tend to see inclusion in society or being part of society as a like a fortuitous side effect of having paid employment or full-time work. And success in this latter imagining tends to really be restricted to employment and personhood, to employability, and often that's represented by a person's ability to uh, uh, have private ownership of land, right? So this incommensurability of Indigenous aspirations and settler imaginings of success have emerged as a really important body of research, I think, describing the shaping of student subjectivities and the erasure of Indigenous difference. Another area we see this is in curriculum, right? So in the Australian curriculum, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cross-curriculum priority is represented as an add-on, uh, as a potential engagement strategy or is often simply ill-defined or, or misinterpreted. And this is about how Indigenous knowledges are represented, how the cultural politics of curriculum reveals the unequal and racialized power relations that shape Indigenous and non-Indigenous subjectivities through schooling. And this is obviously largely drawing on, on the leader's work. What counts as knowledge does often not align with Indigenous notions of relational place-based understandings of what knowledge is. These knowledges tend to disrupt Western narratives of individualism, personal achievement and self-sufficiency in favour of other ways of connecting to the world and to each other. Indigenous knowledges are thus seen as less, as less rigorous and less relevant than settler knowledges. In the systematic review on curriculum, Neil Harrison talks about how curriculum models based on a a funds of knowledge approach challenges deficit assumptions by recognizing that students bring with them historically and culturally embedded knowledges that are actually in fact the foundation of their well-being and participation in society. So we have competing values here, an indigenous value system that sees people as already citizens, no matter their age or capacity or their alleged criminality or, or so on and success as inclusion in both Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities. Almost in opposition to this, are long-term economic priorities of settler colonial societies enacted through schooling as preparation for the job market. And so whilst the illusion of full-time employment uh, still holds potency for many policymakers, educational systems remain geared to a representation of citizenship that prioritises as modes of production, as individual entrepreneurship. In this rendering, schools bear responsibility for preparing citizens who work, not citizens who belong or indeed already belong. The incommensurability of Indigenous aspirations and settler colonial imagines of success therefore become rendered as behavioural problems to be managed. In uh, Uncle Kevin Lowe's review on the effect of culture and language programs on Indigenous students and families, the central role of identity built on strong culture and language programs that are valued more broadly in the school community are, not, are critical to not only engaging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students in their learning, but foreshadowing their own success on their own terms, as well as in the Western sense of the term. So when we think about education, I think it, it takes a great deal to realise that we are not talking about schooling and we are in fact talking about what it takes to educate an Indigenous person to be Indigenous. And that is something that the schooling systems and indeed the criminal justice system is simply not set up to do. Until we change our thinking to position Indigenous success as Indigenous, we are a long way from understanding the role of schooling or just education more broadly uh, 
are serving a meaningful purpose in supporting people to have meaningful lives. It's only when we get clear on these things, I think, that we can begin to address racism as it manifests in Indigenous education and build proper relationships with families and communities. Um, so that, that's me, that's, that's what I have to say on the topic. And I think that it is now my turn to hand over to uh, Dr. Jessica Ganaway. Thank you so much, Nikki. Um, and I, I too would like to begin by um, acknowledging that I'm on the Wo land of the Woiwurrung people today and to pay my respects. And um, it's always an honour to listen to um, and learn from the work of um, Melita and Nikki. Um, and so as I'm listening, the, the question that I continually return to is what is it that we as teachers need to do with this kind of learning? What is it that we as teachers can do within the spaces that we have direct responsibility for and influence over? And so there's two main things that um, emerge for me there. One of those is um, in listening to the kinds of experiences that Melita and Nikki have just shared that students are having. What avenues do students have to um, report these experiences that they have, the experiences of racism they have within schooling settings? And how can I as a teacher stand in solidarity with them in having those experiences addressed? And the other question uh, that I grapple with is what is the kind of internal work? What is the work that we as teachers need to be doing? And I'm uh, particularly referring to my fellow non-Indigenous settler white passing teachers of which there are many of us in the current system. What is the work that we need to be doing within our own dispositions and attitudes and belief systems and biases um, to ensure that classroom spaces are becoming safer? And so this raises an interesting point around how we frame the internal worlds of teachers. Um, in the, a lot of the current discourse around education, we treat this as something that's kind of siloed and separate to a teacher's practice and pedagogy. We don't often draw um, strong lines between the ways that our worldviews and perspectives as teachers do come to bear on um, our interactions with students, our relationships with students and the way that we navigate the classroom. Um, and so, for example, when I search for resources around, you know, what resources are out there to support teachers to interrogate our whiteness, to reflect on um, racism within the school setting, I find a plethora of resources around how teachers can talk to students about racism, how teachers can teach students about biases and racism and things like that. But there are far fewer resources that acknowledge that this is ongoing work that we as teachers need to be engaging with within ourselves as well. Um, and if there's anything that the kind of current conversations we're having as a society really emphasise uh, louder than ever, it's that um, none of us can just automatically claim the status of non-racism. No profession can just claim that we are free of racism. Um, that this is ongoing work that we need to stay continually engaged with. It's work that doesn't end. Um, and in the relatively brief time that I've been in this profession, um, reflecting on the experiences that I've had, um, I've witnessed students being othered. Um, indeed, I've become aware of ways that I am othering my students through my teaching practices. Um, I've witnessed students being discriminated against. I've witnessed well-meaning teachers forecasting students' futures for them, kind of projecting onto them what they can expect from their life trajectories. And I've witnessed the kind of epistemic violence that occurs when we devalue students' knowledge systems um, and languages. And I think about um, those kinds of ugly things that we're confronting. And I also then think about some of the big movements that are happening within education. We've had big shifts happen in the way we think about text selection. Um, so the books that students study in the high school years. We've had a lot of conversations around ensuring that there's a broader range of texts being drawn on and or authors being drawn on that more closely reflect students' life experiences. And we've also had a lot of conversations around um, ensuring that Indigenous perspectives and histories are represented within the curriculum. And yet I think about how all of those kind of curricular concerns are then filtered through and mediated by um, human teachers with our own biases, with our own perspectives and takes on things. Um, it's human teachers on the front lines navigating conversations around the Black Lives Matter movement. It's human teachers navigating conversations around the pandemic and the ways that that is affecting our communities in um, unequal ways. And it's human teachers navigating conversations around police brutality um, or choosing not to have conversations like this depending on their standpoint and worldview. And so what I'd like to highlight is how if we don't examine 
our perspectives, if we don't examine our biases in the ways that we engage in these conversations, then there is tremendous potential for harm. Um, and the flip side being that if we are interrogating our beliefs and uh, unlearning and learning, um, then those conversations can become places, or all the conversations within our classrooms can become places where we are increasing student safety and belonging. Um, so I, I think about the, the EITSL standards, the um, professional standards that guide teachers practice, and the first of those is that we know our students and how they learn. And there's a bit of a kind of silence in the idea of knowing our students, and that is that in order to know someone, we need to know a bit about ourselves and about the biases, um, the lenses through which we see that person. And so that's kind of what I'd like to touch on today, that knowing our students um, involves knowing about the lenses through which we view our students. And so just a few examples from practice, you know, if, if I'm, um, if I really believe that my students' linguistic backgrounds and home literacy practices are an asset, that that brings a wealth of knowledge to my classroom, then I will be finding ways to honour that within the learning that we do as a classroom. If I believe that my students possess tremendous capacity and strength, then that strength space will define how I teach my students. If I believe that this country has a history of colonisation and that those impacts of colonisation are ongoing today, then that will shape the way that I engage with Indigenous perspectives and histories. Um, if I can interrogate my defensiveness, the way that I react as a human when I'm made uncomfortable or challenged, or my power is challenged, um, and if I can really grapple with that, then that places, I'm better placed then to really hear my students when they communicate with me about how um, my classroom is unsafe and, and potentially marginalising. I'm able to better hear the feedback that my students provide to me. Um, but if any of these things are kind of impeded by bias or um, willful ignorance um, or even just dismissed as the fluffy lefty stuff that's irrelevant, which is also par for the course, um, then I think we're really closing down a lot of opportunities to make our classrooms more safe and opportunities to kind of decenter ourselves and centre more on our students' experiences rather than trying to replicate our own learning experiences. Um, so, yeah, so what I'm proposing is that knowing ourselves involves is, is essential to better knowing our students. So if I can reflect upon my unconscious bias, um, if I can unlearn some of the narratives that I've internalized about my students and their communities, if I can learn more about the kind of systemic and structural uh, forces that shape my students' life experiences, then I'm better positioned to understand my students. I'm better positioned to embrace the communities from which my students come and also to stand in solidarity with my students and their families and, and their communities and the kinds of things that they're facing. Um, but for this to happen, we need spaces um, where these conversations can be prioritised, where these conversations happen in rigorous um, and yet safe ways. Um, and I don't think that we can just see this as an add-on um, or an afterthought within the way that we talk about education. Um, if we believe that relationships are at the core of our practice as teachers, um, then we kind of move away from the idea of all of these different aspects of identity just being a tick box that we tick off as we kind of move through professional development, things like that. These things are not just um, boxes to be ticked off for our students, their identities are their entire life experience. And so our interaction with that can make or break their experiences within classroom spaces. Um, and so just a, a few final thoughts to pick up on um, the thread that Melita began around accountability. I think a lot about how um, in this era where there is so much accountability for so many aspects of what teachers do, that it is interesting, uh, not surprising, but interesting that there's very little accountability around the way that we um, interact with our Indigenous students, our students of colour. Um, and my friend Glenn Ald posed a question a number of years ago, um, will there ever be mandatory reporting for racism? And I think there's, there's something for us to really grapple with there. Um, we, in our duty of care as teachers, what is our responsibility when our students are facing uh, racism or um, discrimination within the way the schooling system functions and how will we stand in solidarity with them in the face of those things. So um, to answer the question, how can schools be safer? I think we as teachers have a lot of power over how we grapple with ourselves and our own interactions, how we build respectful relationships with our students and how we stand in solidarity with them with the experiences that they're facing in the classroom. Um, and so then it's my 
honour to them. You know, I've talked a lot about kind of first doing no harm in our classrooms, and I know that um, Leah will now be able to take us deeper into kind of the richness of what safety can look like. Thank you so much, Jess. Um, I'd also like to start by acknowledging um, that I am on the lands of the Wurundjeri and Woiwurrung people. Um, and I, you know, Tulo Kite Mamalu, Tulo Fenua Tene Mote Tangata Fenua. Um, which in my language means I bow my head to the sacredness of this land and to um, the custodians of this land whose connection and responsibilities to this country are unseated. Um, and I also, and Tulo also to Dr. Melita and Dr. Nikki, and I, I, I thank you all and I'm, I'm really honoured to be speaking about you know, issues of safety in education. I think it's really exciting that this conversation is occurring and I um, I work in a prison with young people and I can see, uh, you know, in the repeated um, kind of stories that I hear of being rejected from, in, um, from education kind of, uh, yeah, point to huge issues like structural issues. Um, but I'll start by locating myself because I'm not, um, I don't live in a vacuum. I live, I'm part of a complex environment and, and a history. So, um, my ancestry is Tuvaluan and Irish. Um, I'm a mother and a broadcaster and a whole range of different things. And I'm actually not a trained teacher. Um, I came to teaching from um, a background of working in psychotherapy and looking at cultural inclusion in psychotherapy. Um, I came to Parkville College as a music teacher. Um, and I've been mentored by David Vadavelu and Rachel Nanganak Edwardson who are two um, experts in cultural safety in education and cultural safety more broadly um, from their work all around the world. So, um, I, and, I, and I say, and I locate myself um, and acknowledge like the shoulders of the people that I stand on and I acknowledge the um, country that I stand on and I acknowledge the complex system and, um, you know, culture that I live in or cultures. Um, and I do that because our students are also, like Jess, to pick up on what Jess was saying, our students are also <laughs> do not live in a vacuum. They are um, of their environment and their context. And so, um, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But to, um, yeah, to give you a little bit of background about um, Parkville College. So um, it's a school that's located in the youth justice precincts in Parkville and Malmesbury, and more recently also includes secure welfare. Um, and we've got a flexible learning centre in Collingwood. And so, um, and I'll speak from like myself and my own practice, um, you know, beyond education. And I'll speak a bit about Parkville College in the context I'm working with them. Um, and I'll sort of jump between those places. But I, um, I came to the school two and a half years ago and the school was actually established in 2012 um, by Brendan Murray and a crew of, um, I would say really courageous um, social workers and teachers who fought really hard to ensure that um, young people who are in custody have access to education and their basic human rights met. Um, so the school was established with a strong trauma-informed practice and a focus on relationships and unconditional positive regard for all students, which I believe to be quite radical, especially in that context. And so, um, and I never had the privilege of working directly with Brendan Murray, but um, what I'm told repeatedly is that he would repeatedly say relationships, relationships, relationships. So um, a school was established in, you know, a fairly unlikely place that absolutely um, centered students and focused on relationships. And then um, in 2016, David Vadivelu and Rachel Nangina Edwardson were brought into the school after posing a question, a really interesting question, um, how can you have a trauma-informed practice that is not culturally safe. Because we know that, um, you know, from neuroscience, that the brain can't distinguish between physical and psychological threat. And so um, trauma-informed must include <laughs> and centre cultural safety. In fact, cultural safety includes trauma-informed. So um, they came to the school and started implementing, um, you know, and have been guiding the school um, since that time like through the journey of implementing cultural safety in education, which is um, holistic <laughs> and, and a really big job. So it's um, a pedagog pedagogical reform um, that's anchored in culturally responsive practice. 
And much like the practice of cultural safety, it has to be holistic and it involves a structural um, and policy and practice based planning model that's driven by the decentering of um, institutions and the recentering of community and students. Um, and that's like a whole bunch of things that I don't know uh, will make much more sense. Uh, I don't know if that makes um, sense, but I'll speak more specifically about that. Um, but I do want to point out, <laughs> um, and I'm reminded of this all the time, that it is, it is legacy work. Like the day that you plant the seed is not the day you eat the fruit. Like the conditions have to be laid for um, cultural safety to be embraced and embedded into practice. And that takes a long time and it has to happen on multiple levels. So, um, yeah, from staffing quotas to the interrogation of curriculum and delivery, like in all aspects of um, the school and the institution and practice. So, um, and they're currently writing a book on cultural safety and education, which in which they will um, explain much more eloquently than I can this process. Um, but cultural safety, the term comes from um, the Māori community and Ira Petty Ramston um, several decades ago, you know, brought this into the health sector and then not long after um, went, you know, kind of scolded um, her community around um, that cultural safety doesn't belong only with them, that it's inclusive of all people. So I want to be, I want to create a culturally safe environment for every student that walks into my classroom. Um, and so what she talks about is like how, um, one, one quote from her is that her experiences showed me, um, sorry, my experiences showed me that there were fundamental and brutal injustices in our society. And I wanted to know how and why they got there, how they worked and how they were sustained. And um, that quote really strikes me because I think if we want to engage in anti-oppressive work, we have to, um, as practitioners, we're required to be able to um, recognize oppression on every level that it occurs. And so being interested in the how and the why and how does this continue is a really important part of becoming critically conscious and um, working with students. So, um, yeah, as I said, um, we know that the brain can't, you know, uh, uh, the brain can't function and, and be in a learning space without being um, culturally safe. And so in response to the question about how we make schools um, culturally safe and relationally safe, I would say <laughs> the answer always lies with the students themselves and their communities because they're, um, they're, that's where the strength lies and that's where um, the, the answer to the question of what does safety look like, that, it, that always depends on the context. Um, but more broadly, I would say that in order to have safe spaces, we need to have safe bodies and safe nervous systems. We need to have safe practice and we need to have safe um, structures and they can't exist without each other. So um, as far as bodies go, something that I've noticed and I, it's, I'm finding it really difficult to cover all of this in 10 minutes, but I'll say just really briefly on bodies, what I've noticed about nervous systems when working with teachers and working with students is that our nervous systems betray so much about our biases and about our conditioning and students, whether or not they are um, completely conscious of it, especially if they come from um, a trauma background, are constantly reading nervous systems and environments and looking for these indications of safety. And so if our nervous systems, like if our mouths are saying everybody's included, but our nervous system has not um, kind of interrogated the idea that certain people are scary and certain people are dangerous, then we are, um, we're telling a very incongruent story to our students and we're not creating safety. So that, um, so that's one note on, on bodies. <laughs> and then as far as practice goes, I think, um, yeah, picking up also on what Jess said, you know, if we, eights or one, if we want to know our students and how they learn, we have to know our students within their context. So when I introduce myself, I introduce myself like through my bloodline um, and my profession and the knowledge systems that I work within and the people who have guided me to become, you know, who I am. I didn't name all of them, but all of those things are absolutely relevant um, for, you to, for you to know who I am or a bit about who I am. And they're absolutely central for us to know about who our students are. And so um, recentering community and collaborating with community and students around um, 
what safety looks like and actually what education is and should be is essential for um, a culturally responsive practice, which is, um, you know, the foundation of which is cultural safety. And then um, the last point is that we need culturally safe systems to be able to sustain the culturally safe bodies and culturally safe practice. You, I, it is an exhausting and um, really, really tiring um, undertaking to try and be culturally safe in a classroom within an institution that doesn't support that. And so um, what is unique and I think quite radical about Parkville College is that an enormous amount of taking care of the conditions has gone into um, uh, like planning for um, culturally safe conditions. And so that includes um, Auntie Joy Murphy, who we're lucky enough to have um, leading our elders council, um, has uh, organised an elders council, which um, consults directly to the executive of our school, um, representative of our student cohort. We have, um, since David and Rachel started at our school, our staffing profile went from three people of colour to now about 46. Um, again, representative of the communities that our students come from. Um, every single staff member that comes to our school has to do cultural safety training prior, three days of, prior to doing um, culturally responsive practice. Um, that's the threshold for the practice. Um, we have our IPAL staff, um, our Indigenous um, staff and culturally and linguistically diverse. Oof, um, <laughs> has their own wellbeing group and wellbeing systems to support and, um, you know, that acknowledge that epistemic violence is a thing and that, you know, support is um, needed and it's specific, especially working in a prison. Um, yeah. Anyway, I won't go into that. Um, and what else do we have? So uh, we have cultural education teams which um, prioritise and centre like strength-based cultural education, again, from the communities of the students that we have. Um, and a whole range of really, really important structural um, uh, structures and policies that, that support this. And so now we're kind of at implementation and we're doing this, you know, really um, big work, I would say, of, of, um, of, of implementing this and embedding it into our school. Um, so, yeah, in answer to the question, like, how do we make schools uh, relationally and culturally safer? I would just, I, I, you know, I think back to just that this is legacy work and that, you know, the satisfaction that we want, the urgency I feel, you know, in my um, passion for justice and equity, um, it's not going to be satisfied by the pace with which this needs to kind of move because we're working with 230 years of colonization on this country. And we're only just starting to really acknowledge and speak the truth of the history and the context within which we're living. And this is really difficult work. And what I do say to teachers um, all the time in training is that when we're interrogating our conditioning and our biases and the histories that we've been taught and what we stand for as teachers, we're never interrogating the worth of humans. We're interrogating the way that we've been conditioned. And so whilst this is really challenging work for teachers and it, you know, myself included, um, I, I just want to yeah, reiterate that, you know, the humanity of teachers is what, like one of our biggest strengths and the conditioning of teachers is one of the biggest barriers between us and seeing our students clearly. And so, um, and so I, yeah, I really encourage kind of um, making that distinction <laughs> when we set off to do this work. So um, I'll finish there. It's obviously an enormous question and I'm really excited to start this conversation. And thank you so much for organizing this and I'll throw it back to you, Dr. Sophie Rudolph. Thank you so much, Leah. And thank you to all the panelists for um, sharing with us uh, the research and the practice work that you've been engaging in, all of you, for quite a long time. Um, and really, I think helping us to understand this, um, this issue as something that is layered and complex and that it does require us to meet that complexity um, in terms of, of doing this work together. So understanding both that the, the structural um, challenges 
that we're facing and the capacity for the interpersonal and relational work that we can do together. So it's been a really fantastic conversation so far. Um, I'm aware of our time and um, we're getting close to our hour, but uh, the, I'll just flag a couple of the questions that have come through in the chat. And just, I wanna remind everyone that this is the beginning of a, a bigger conversation. I mean, it is a conversation that's been going on for <laughs> a long time already, but we do want you to um, make contact with us and to, to think together about ways in which we can continue to address these issues so it doesn't stop here. Um, we've got a, a couple of questions to the panel um, and one of them is around language so um, thinking about how do we challenge um, ideas such as um, troublemaker um, and how might we use different kinds of um, language from diversity and inclusion which kind of sometimes are a bit empty, the empty kind of signifiers and what might we need to do to shift some of that. Um, is there someone who would like to take on that question or shall I, <laughs> shall I ask someone? <laughs> Nikki, do you want to have a go at it? <laughs> well, I Sure, I will. I will have a go. Uh, recognizing that, um, again, I'm you know I'm I'm not a trained teacher. I don't I don't work in those particular contexts. But I think, um, like Leah was saying, you know, there are a whole range of patterned responses that we uh, that we are conditioned to accept as normal, right? And so the first part of I think undoing that patterning is is recognizing that these are very loaded concepts right these are when we describe people in particular ways where um we're reinforcing a, a deficit narrative in a particular way and sometimes i find it helpful for me the way that i think about deficit narrative is that we take a social problem whether that be someone who is is non-compliant or someone who belongs to a, a racial or ethnic minority or someone who is deemed problematic or deviant in in a broader social sense and part of the patterning is that we then um, apply that social understanding onto the body of an individual and we we treat the person that is in front of us as if they are representative of all of these imagined you know, social ills or, or racist beliefs or whatever that we hold very broadly. So I think that Leah's um, kind of approach to understanding that there is a really complex um, physiology that underpins some of these patterning things. Now, I'm, I'm not going to get all Deleuzean on everyone and, you know, start to, start to talk about, you know, unnecessary um, theoretical approaches to these things. But I, I think that you know, when both Jess and, and Leah are talking about the way that, that, that these are human beings that hold biases and human beings that have patterning, but yet we can't see the human being who's in front of us as representative of anything other than our deficit assumptions about who that group or, or whomever is in, in broader society. So I don't think that the solution is finding different words to describe the person who is in front of us. I think that the solution much more lies in the kinds of approaches that, that Jess and Leah are talking about, which is fundamentally recognizing our own humanity and hopefully the humanity of the human being who is in front of us. Melita, I'll hear from you as well. <laughs> uh, and you, you raise a good point, Nikki, in the fact that you know, it, it is that normalization of the dominant norm uh, and the, the ne necessity for society to provide labels and to consistently label and group people and things together. And, and it's merely this power play and this privilege of, of, of needing to maintain and sustain that power by showing difference. And I think um, as, as classroom teachers or just as human beings or members of this society is, is that unlearning 
of, of the colonizing mindset of consistently looking for the, the binaries and, and, and showing superiority. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah. And I think it is that tension between um, difference as, as a, um, as a label of that, that is negative and how we actually value and work with difference as a, a really wonderful and, and important and helpful thing in our communities. Um, we've got another, uh, I guess, a, a bit of a challenge to us as um, a panel in terms of this notion of mandatory reporting of racism. Um, and while that might be useful in some ways, does it, um, does it, will it do what it needs to do, I think is the question from Tonya here. So she says, um, how do you document an institution or system for racism rather than the individual? I think, you know, it's, I guess it's that tension between um, calling out an individual for racism in a system that is already racist. Um, uh, are there um, some thoughts on that one? Um, <laughs> Jess, do you want to have a go? Yes, certainly, yep, yep. And I think kind of there's there's two parts of this. There's the, the kind of, um, there's the call for us as teachers to be reflecting on ourselves so that these things don't happen in the first place. But knowing that not all teachers will be inclined to do that. We need to have ways of having conversations when, um, when students do still experience racism. Um, and so I think about, um, you know, I, I know that uh, a mandatory reporting system for experiences of racism is, is probably pretty unlikely to occur. But again, the question is, how are we standing in solidarity with students? Um, how are we taking seriously that when students report that they've experienced racism, that it, it has actually been experienced and that we follow through on that? Because a lot of the stories that I hear reflect that it is kind of minimised and dismissed within schooling settings. And so I think of um, what Hayley Maguire from the National Indigenous Youth Education Coalition says. She says that the work of inclusion is done when our students say it's done. So that kind of sets a benchmark for, you know, if we're talking about creating safer spaces and more inclusive environments, then listening to students feedback to us what we might not want to hear, which might be that schools, uh, our school that we're part of um, still has uh, moments of racism happening, then I think listening to the student's voice and taking that on board is something that we really need to do better as school um, institutions. Thank you. Leah, did you want to add anything to that? Dilemma. <laughs> um, yeah, it is really hard. It's hard to call out individual behaviour in an entire system that is soaking everybody <laughs> in um, and this idea that this is acceptable or, you know, that won't over, you know, true histories and kind of name things for what they are. Um, I guess it, I don't have a direct answer to... <laughs> um, the reporting of, but I do think it's so important just from a practice, you know, perspective and from relationships to acknowledge it for our students, because it's absolutely crazy making to feel like the whole world is against you when everyone's denying that that's the case. And what I hear a lot from what, what I'm interested in is that the cohort of students that we work with and look after and are responsible or at Parker College, um, you know, the world seems to be um, fixed on what our students have done to other people mm -hmm. and is not very interested in what the world has done to my students. And if, you know, um, we don't, yeah, and like Jess was saying, like if we look at, what, like what everyone said, if we look at a resilience, um, the resilience in young people that we work with, if we look at their strengths, um, like we need to be able to, acknowledge what they face um, around the systems of oppression in order to acknowledge the strengths and the resilience that have gotten them through that. So I think that it's really important that we name the structures of racism and that we name the entire epistemologies that support racism and, um, and we look at our own internal structures of oppression and our relational ones. So I feel like it has to happen all at the same time and I have no idea how that would be reported. <laughs> Nikki. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, to, to build on, on that thing that Leah was talking about, um, this is also about understanding the effects of racism. So I, um, I remember um, some research on, on 
on bullying, forgive me, I, I, can't, I can't recall who, who did it, but in understanding uh, teachers' responses to bullying and the effectiveness of different types of intervention about bullying, uh, this research seemed to suggest that the only factor which determined the success of any teacher's intervention into an incidence of bullying was determined by the extent to which the teacher believed that the impacts of bullying were real. Mm -hmm. So this suggested that it didn't matter what a t particular teacher did, it didn't matter how you went ab about intervening or, or responding to the situation, what really mattered was whether or not the teacher believed, like in their heart of hearts, believed that bullying could result in life-threatening situations, that people understood the psychological, the physical, the spiritual, the emotional impacts of what bullying is. And sometimes I wonder if our understanding of racism is as sufficiently refined. Do people understand what racism is, how it manifests, and its its biological, its cognitive, its social impacts, which can proceed from um, the moment of conception all the way through to, to intergenerational issues can manifest in a whole range of different ways. So I think that, um, you know, you can imagine mandatory reporting frameworks for anything that has a human rights component, right? If something is illegal, if something violates a legal framework, then, you know, sure, we can imagine that. But I think like Leah and Jess have said, that there is something about understanding, truly understanding the life-threatening impact that racism can have on people as a motivating force for actually doing something about it. Yeah. Thank you, Nikki. Um, in the interests of time, I think we'll just have one word more from each of the panelists. So just anything that either you want to leave the audience with to have a bit more of a think about or a final reflection that you would like to offer. Um, so Melita, would you like to start on that? <laughs> um, I guess something, are you looking for something profound? <laughs> um, Definitely, always. <laughs> I, I guess it's, it's great to actually start having these conversations and, and for the 110 participants that are in this room, it's great that you're, you're willing to engage with these conversations, that the, the things that we're, we're looking for and that kind of transformative education is is a a very difficult thing to do and we need as many allies as we can because as you've heard in the discussions today um there's there is a very complex structure that we are coming up against thank you melita nikki oh look i've probably said enough really haven't i i guess i think that it's, it's so important to begin having these conversations and the process of, of public education, I think. You know, we, we talk a lot in initial teacher education and the sociology of education. We do a lot of talking with, with teachers and, and with students, but I think very much there is a, a broader public conversation and that feeds into, you know, this programs of institutional change, I think, that we're all really deeply committed to. So. It's a, a wonderful panel. I feel very privileged um, to be able to talk to everyone today. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Nikki. Jess? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, just some final thoughts around um, teachers and our relationship um, between, you know, being an individual and being part of a structure, which is a huge part of um, our work as teachers. And so uh, my research and my inquiry in this space has come from a place of being a young teacher within a structure that felt impossibly stacked against the kind of justice aims that I had um, as, as, you know, going into the education profession. And so turning the lens into what is actually within our control as teachers is a really powerful way of recognising that we are part of these structures, but we also have a degree of agency in how we impact upon the students directly in our, um, in our care. And so, um, yeah, this is an, an invitation to continue talking about that. We all have so much that we can continue to learn in this space. Um, and it's been a great honour to be part of this conversation with you all today. So thanks for coming and thanks for organising, Sophie. Pleasure, Jess. Thank you. And Leah. Thank you. 
Yeah, I will also just say thank you so much. It's an honor to be um, sitting here with all of you and having this conversation. And um, I guess I'll just leave by saying I've not met a single teacher that doesn't want the best outcomes for our students. And um, what those outcomes are and what those outcomes, which knowledge systems those outcomes are based in and who determines like the success of those outcomes sits with our students and their communities. And so I think what we as educators want is the same thing, but uh, which is, is the best outcomes, but that will be always determined by our students and their communities. And I think that's where we need to be focusing the conversations, some of the conversations. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the panel for coming together, for offering us your thoughts and your reflections and your challenges. Um, thank you to the audience for being with us this morning. And we hope that um, you will continue to engage with this in this work with us. And so please do get in touch with um, the Justice Involved Young People Network and us at the MGSE if you would like to be further involved as we continue these conversations. Thanks again, everyone.